upload anything, right? It's an online test, or do you have to upload? We do. <laughs> it's on Canvas, but we have to upload images onto Canvas. Well, I'll tell you, there is a bottleneck because my students uh, in another class in Radar were trying to upload their, I had them put it on a Word document and upload it. And they were um, like just hung for 15, 20 minutes. So the timestamp on there is when I guess it's uploaded and a lot of them, it said late on there. But I waived that and I bet you that might happen for Dr. News class too. Did you, any of you have trouble uploading? No. Mm -mm. What software did he use actually? I've never seen it before. Well, I didn't have any trouble, but I had him put it in a Word document and then go to Canvas and um, put it in as an assignment. I had it just test one. Sort of like you guys did, remember? Oh, uh, yeah. Hmm. Y'all can turn on your cameras. This is sort of a, a chat time. You got nine out of 25. And how many are in Auburn? I know Ruth, I Lydia, you're in Auburn, Cole? Yeah. Uh, is Jack or not? I'm not sure. No? I don't think he is. Matthew, are you in Auburn? Uh, yeah, I am. All uh, right, so that's four. Chad, no, you're, you're in Montgomery, aren't you? Or no, where are you? Uh, I'm in Huntsville, or technically Huntsville. Yeah, but uh so you you your your connection's fine i'm I'm wondering about people in the outlying areas if their zoom connection has lag or problems and lucas has a little ring occasionally when i was listening to him i think it's just that my like i have feedback through my microphone and speaker oh, oh okay all right well we got we got nine participants does anybody have questions before i get started <laughs> Nothing. I know you're starting studying for your digitron. So uh, I'm telling you where we're going with this. We're going to do filters today, and um, okay. Oh man. I'm. Hey, but gives me. I'm gonna run and grab my notebook. I'll be back. Okay. You're. Are you recording it though? Yeah. You're recording. Okay. All right. Um. What I'm going to talk about today is digital filters, and I'll go from, uh, I want to do one thing before I do that, though. Um, I'm going to cast a screen, so, or I should say share a screen. I can find it. Share screen. And uh, share two. And then I'm going to pull up. Um, we're not going to do, do you see a PowerPoint of Z transforms of various functions? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, yeah, I'm going to just tell you um, why I'm doing this. I, this is sort of a, hey, we got somebody in a waiting room. Okay. I got it. Uh, what, what I want to tell you is I'm trying to draw parallels between Laplace and Z as best I can. It'll help you and in inside because what we're going to do is filter design. Now, if you look at this, a unit impulse is the same. I mean, it's a delta function is one. The transform is one in either Z or Laplace, and everybody sees that. One over S, what people call this is an integrator. And for one over S, I'm trying to get this thing so I can actually see people. I don't know why it does this. Uh, we got somebody else in the waiting room. Uh, got him. Well, anyway, how come I can't? Uh, there we go. I'm trying to get a better idea. Of, I'm, it's very odd teaching when you don't have faces. You can read people and get an idea. All right, the unit impulse one is one. The one over S is really an integrator. And the equivalent Z transform of that is Z over Z minus one or one over one minus Z to the minus one. And I think everybody is comfortable with that, right? You can get this by doing a sampled signal and just do the Laplace trans transform of it. That's what you're going to get. A ramp function AT 
but it should have a u of t next to it. This assumes the function is only on for t greater than zero. Well, that's just linearly ramping up, and that has a z transform of a over, I mean, a Laplace of a over s squared. The z of that is a t. Now, it's important to realize that t there is the actual sample time. And then you could put time z, uh, you, it, this is one over z here, and one, one minus c to the minus one squared. But if you multiply top and bottom by z squared, then you get a t z over, and then it becomes z squared minus one. And somebody else is here. Okay, thank you. This is a uh, going to be a function that's going to be a t to a power, and it would have a Laplace transform of this. The z transform would be this. Uh, e to the minus a t, you're familiar with that, that's one over s plus a, and the z transform of that is really z over z minus e to the minus a t, or what this usually is replaced by is just a constant a. And finally, t e to the minus a t is one over s plus a squared, and this is the equivalent z transform of that if it's sampled at the rate t. And I'm putting this here for everybody's sake, okay? Matter of fact, why don't, this is on page um, 15 of this. I'm going to send everybody um, a copy of this right now because it's got a whole lot of other information. For instance, in the next slide, it, it really does show you the equivalency between time domain Laplace, I'm sorry, Laplace transform from continuous time to Z transforms in sample time. It, and it draws direct parallels. And this is useful. You'll see this. Can you all see that on your screen? Okay. Let me see if I can send this file to you, the whole PowerPoint if I can. Uh, share, email, send as attachment. Where, where did it go? Oh, it's trying to attach it. Okay, where is it? <laughs> there it is. So now I'm going to send it to the class. Just let me know if you get this. I didn't make it into a, P a PDF. I gave you the actual file. I think it's it's better. Um, they go through. I'm going to tell you that this PowerPoint has a lot of things about how sampling works. Uh, he'll go through a sample how it go from continuous time with Laplace to sampled time and look at it as Z. But I'm giving this to you as a reference. A lot of the stuff you know, I'm just giving it to you. And the really on 15 and 16 are the important parts where they show the actual similarities between two. Okay. Now, shut that down. And now I'm going to do the um, what I've come to what I intended to do today was my camera. This is about filter design and filtering in general. I'm going to show you some information about it. Um, where'd the camera go? Not this again. Hey. Hang on. I don't know why it does this, but sometimes it doesn't recognize it's plugged in and I have to move it to a different USB port and a USB 2. Come on. All right, this time it was. So, 
when you do Z transform filtering, I'm going to go into the Z plane first and I'll try to explain this and I have a program to show you. In general, if we think about Laplace, well, if we think about Laplace transforms and we have H of S here, and we looked at just the magnitude of H of S versus say, let S go to J omega. So what I'm doing is I'm going to have the magnitude of H of S, but we're really going to substitute J omega for that because now we have basically the Fourier transform of the filter response. And when we plot it versus omega, versus omega you know yourself, if you see something like this, if this is the origin and you see this, right? That would be a low pass filter. doesn't matter what that is, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. This is Laplace now. Now, if you go down a little further and if, if I had something like this on an exam where you saw this, if this was the magnitude, uh, I'll just call it H of omega, then, and assume this, these things are, they're not shown that way, but they should be mirror images of each other across um, the Z, Z axis, or I should say, we could fold this onto that. And what type of filter would this be if this is omega? Bandpass. 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 Band if you had a filter like this, you're right. That would be anyone? High pass. Yeah, high pass. High pass, right. So you guys, you know how to recognize in the omega domain what type of filter operation is, is being, is happening, correct? Mm -hmm. Everybody? Yeah. All right. Now, if you've got that, the next thing I'm going to say is in the Z domain, it's a little different because now when you take a look in the Z domain, it's just like going in the S domain. First, let me just sh show you this. If you're talking about a function H of S and I'm in the S plane where this is Sigma and this is J omega, now I'm going to, Here's where I'm trying to draw parallels. This is just in the omega domain right here. We're looking at filters. You recognize high pass, low pass very easily, right? When I actually show you as frequency sweep, it's easy to identify. Now I'm going to do pole zeros. So if I have zeros here and here, and I have poles here and here, well, what type of a filter is that? Take a guess. Low pass. Low pass. You're right. The poles tell you where the signal, I mean, where the, the transfer function blows up, correct? Mm -hmm. And you can see these are at frequencies here. Uh, it could be a bandpass, actually. But if you take a look at this, we could build this filter very easily. We could say, and the, and the poles are always conjugate pairs. We could say that H of S was equal to Here's the zeros, so you have Z, my, or I mean, sorry, you would have S minus, and then it would be called this pole one, pole two, and then S minus pole two. Then, I mean, not pole, zero two, I call it. This should be a Z. <laughs> Let me try that again. Call that zero one and zero two, and this pole one, and this is pole one conjugate. So the transfer function H of S would be some constant K, and then you would have S minus Z1, zero one, and S minus zero two. And then downstairs, you're gonna have S minus pole one and S minus pole one conjugated. You follow me on this? I just showed your pole zero mapping that K is a constant. This is what the function would look like. You could assemble it just by inspection. Correct, class? Question. So is the pole, pole one conjugate on like the bottom half of the axes? Yeah, this is pole one. This would be the conjugate because pole one would be some real, right? Plus J omega one, right? And the conjugate, pole one conjugate would be the real part minus J omega one. And that's where the pole exists. Okay. And now, if you take a look at this, you can multiply this out. But really, what happens in, in this? Well, the, the zeros are out here. They're at high frequency. Do you all see that, class? 
So when we start at z equals, I mean, if, the, if we look at h of j omega now, or j, h of omega, when we take a look at this, if h of zero is simply what? Well, it's really k times z1, 0, 1, 0, 2, the negative signs will cancel, over really p1, p1 conjugate, correct? That's when the frequency or s is zero, correct? Everybody see that? I'm not doing this in a way the book does it. I'm building from, I'm trying to show you a relationship with filter development and creation in the S domain, really the omega domain. But I start with the S domain to show you the pole zero locations. Now, you can see that there are poles. I mean, it, here's what this filter is going to look like, I'll just tell you. It's got some value at, at, at if this is omega, and this would be H of omega that I'm talking about right here. You can call H of, let S be J omega. All right, just let S be J omega right here. And it's got a value at zero that's non-zero. That's my point about this. Now it has poles here and here. So as I'm moving up the frequency, right, I'm going to get something like this. It's going to have a relative bump there, relative bump here. These, these will be, uh, they'll, this will be an even function, so everything on the positive omega axis, you can just fold over on the minus omega axis, but it'll do something like this. And when you get at the pole, it's not going to be going to infinity because there's a real part to this. You follow me on that? All right. Then, now the zeros come in. The zeros are at higher frequency, or the zeros are out here. And what I can do, actually what I need to do is this. Um, that will work, but they'll basically go down and taper like this. Now, if, if these poles are significantly small, or they're close to zero, then this would be a true low pass. But as I move them up, it'll be more of a band pass. This is just to give you perspective on what we're about to do with the Z transforms. And you'll get a lot of this in John Hung's class on controls later, but this is just perspective. Everybody follow me on this? I know it's kind of hand-waving. I'm not putting exact numbers here. I'm just trying to sh show you a trend, how to locate trends. Now, with the Z transforms, this is where I wanted to go today. With Z, what we do is we look in the Z plane. And this, is, this is, I'm introducing you to filter concepts. Slide First, it I down a to, touch. Yeah, I'm going to actually... Do this in a way where I'm going to show you trends first, and then we'll nail down things where if you want an exact type of filter, how you would build it. So for this, you always go to the one circle, create a one circle, radius one, right there. And we know if I have an H of Z right here, when we do a frequency sweep on that, we let Z become E to the J capital omega. I think you can appreciate that, right? If we're going to do a frequency sweep, we're going to let Z become E to the J omega, correct? Are you with me or not? Omega, you see, you want to be, you want to have this be E to the J omega, and you're going to sweep around from zero to two pi in C, or from minus pi to pi, and see what H looks like. I got somebody else out there. Do you all agree with that? Now hang in there. This is in the first part of uh, chapter eight. So now what I say is, if I want a, I've got to tell you this, what, where's, the, where's the frequencies that are low frequencies? Well, this, is, this point is at zero frequency. It's DC effectively, right? E to the J zero would be one. That would be DC. You can put it down if you want, right? You all agree with that? Now, as I'm rotating around, I'm sweeping the frequency and I'm letting Z being E to the J omega, I'm moving out this way, this gets higher and higher frequencies. On this side is high frequency. All right. Can you all appreciate this? Try to remember that what is omega in, in terms of the time domain? Omega is actually what? Small omega times T sampling, right? Is that right? So as I'm increasing the value of omega, it's like increasing the value of small omega. We're going higher and higher frequencies. Now, if you want to create a low-pass filter, 
what you want in general is to have poles at low frequencies, but you don't want the poles to be actually on the axis because that will cause an instability. So you would have conjugate pair poles here and here. This would be P1, P1 conjugate. This would be for low pass. And then you want zeros. Now your zeros can be absolute zeros. So you may want a zero there and a zero there. And in the book where this is shown, okay, a good picture of this is on page 423 in the figure. If you all have your books, just turn there, page 423. And again, this is, we're not putting down exact, we're not trying to develop an exact low pass filter with a certain amount of dB roll off. What we're doing is getting, we're learning the trends right now in filter development. And he shows this, um, y'all see that he has the zeros at plus and minus 139 degrees and they're right on the axis. And then he has the poles uh, at 0.5 e to the e to the j minus 60. Do y'all see this class? Give me a thumbs up if you've located it in your book. It's on page 243. All right. Now, with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and get my MATLAB program because really this is where MATLAB or or you could use Octave or Python. I've learned some Python. So I want to take a look at what happens to a filter, and I'll put it in here, where we're going to have poles at plus minus 139 degrees and zeros at plus, oh, sorry, plus minus 60 degrees and we're gonna we're gonna do a little we're gonna explore this if you have matlab you can bring it up if you've got multiple screens but if you don't i i, I can appreciate your problem so what i do is this remember what i want to do is show you the frequency response of this filter so i'm going to have a linear spacing from minus pi to pi now you don't have to do that you can actually go from zero to two pi but it has to be over a range of um, it, of two pi. I like to go from minus pi to pi because that is really the entire frequency band compressed. Usually when we do Fourier transforms, we go from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? In the omega domain. When we take a look at what they look like. And there'll be a portion of that, in, that infinite domain where the filter actually has characteristics that are, are visible and important that are non-zero. Now I put the, I let Z be E to the, G. first I create this omega, then I say the zeros, omega is zero, is it 139 times pi over 180, because I'm going to be working in radians, so I take the 139 degrees, and I simply, remember that's high frequencies, right? Once we're past 90 degrees, they're high frequencies, think of it that way. And these are zeros, so that means I'm going to get rid of the signal that's at high frequency. I've got, I'm going to have two, one at 139 and one at minus 139. Then I'm going to have poles at 60 degrees. So I put 60 times PI over 180, and I'm letting A be 0.5, and that's just the weight in front of the exponential. My, in terms of uh, this value of, this is the actual, Z here is just the, the um, value of uh, Z when I sweep the frequency, it's e to the J omega. Uh, the poles are at, uh, omega pole and, and the zeros are at, at omega zero. But what I do is this, when I create H, I say it's Z minus Z naught and then times Z minus Z naught conjugate. And the reason you use conjugate pairs on this is what it does is it strengthens the zero. It will make it a stronger zero, if that makes sense. Things will go down quicker that way. Now the poles are conjugate pairs too. Can you all see this? I didn't put a constant in front of here, but I could. The constant will just scale it up or down. And when I plot this, now they don't do it this way in the book, but normally what you do is plot 
omega, and then 20 times the log base 10 of the absolute value of H. Because a lot of these filters will have three or four orders of magnitude of change. And on a linear plot, you don't see the real characteristics because they don't have the dynamic range to show it. Does everybody understand that? We so can do a linear. Is the apostrophe the conjugate? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, ask any questions about this. And, and, and matter of fact, let me just show you these things because I know you haven't. Uh, I want to make sure that I've got. All right, if I have, for instance, at the bottom of the screen, if I let A be equal to 1 plus 1J one times just 1J, just leave it like that. So you can see. Did I get booted off of this thing? <laughs> there, you can see that that's the value of A, one plus J. Mm -hmm. My I is the same thing as J. If I put A apostrophe, that's the conjugate. Okay. You see it? That's, that's one thing about MATLAB. The conjugate operator is something that I like. Now, now I'm gonna take a look at this and I'm gonna plot it and I'm gonna do this first on a logarithmic scale and 20 times the log uh, base 10 of the absolute value of H. I'll take a look at what it looks like. And you can see here that this is minus pi, this is plus pi, right? And if, this re if you just take a look at this, this has low pass characteristics, right? But you get a little bit here, 3.14, you're going to get a little bit of a kick right here where it's not quite low pass. But if you look at the dynamic range, it goes from somewhere of about 13 or 14 down to minus 10 dB. So that's 24 dB, the dynamic range here in dB. Correct, class? You all see that? Not again, sorry. I Dy dynamic range is the difference between the peak value and the minimum value. Well, the abs I s it's, this is the absolute minimum, but that's not really fair because that's a zero. What you look at is the minimum value here on the second peak. You don't want this, by the way. You would like this to just keep going down to zero. Okay. So the dynamic range between these two peaks would be about 13 or 14 dB to about minus, say, 11, right? It's about 25 dB. Do you all see this? Give me a, I mean, you see that's a low pass characteristic, right? It's not ideal, but it is low pass, correct? Now, one way of strengthening this or making it better, and this is just a simple way, is, well, if this is good, why don't we take this and multiply it by itself? That will accentuate the highs and reduce the lows even greater. Do you agree? So what I can do is make H equal to H dot, and don't forget that dot, times H itself. And you can actually put a conjugate operator there. And then it should be H dot, uh, H dot times H conjugate. And now take a look, we'll see what happens. Oh no, I forgot, <laughs> I'm bad. That's what I get for, this is a mistake you don't want to make with the code. Oh, hey. I get rid of this conch. It's replotting. Let's Can you that. explain why you put the conch? Normally, if you want an absolute value of something, if you have, for instance, let's see if I have A still. Oops, I don't. If I make A equal to one plus J1. All right. Oh, yeah. it's got to be 1J, sorry, 1J. If you take a look at this, if I take A dot times A, I'm going to get this. All right. You'll notice that's 2I. But if I go ahead and I take A dot A conjugate, it's real. It gets rid of the imaginary. Can you all see that? Now, what I was trying to do, and unfortunately it didn't work, uh, I was trying to make, and I don't know why this thing showed all those. H dot H conjugate. Let me just, well, let me do it this way first and just see. 
All right, now the dynamic range, please take a look at this. It goes from 20, what, what would you say there's 27 maybe here? Yeah. To minus 20, that dynamic range doubled, All right? Even though on this scale, it, it looks very similar, but the dynamic range is what you look at. This is a much better low pass filter. And I've taken H and multiplied it by H. It's like running it through one filter, then running it through another filter, with the same properties. The things you want accentuated are accentuated, the things you want nullified are nullified. Is Just it important through... that the top of the curve flattens? Well, that's your, oh, let me get it back up here. We're gonna be talking about a lot of stuff. Um, right here, from here to here, where this signal would drop by 3 dB is called the bandwidth, from here to here. Oh, okay. That's where the actual signal strength falls off is one over the square root of two, the peak fit. And this is a low pass filter. And I think you can all see that. Mm -hmm. Now, here are some of the things that happen. I'm going to get back the original filter and I want to just take you through this so you can appreciate this. Let me get rid of this thing. So what happens if I make, let's just take a look at this for a second. If we take a look at that and what happens if I go ahead and make A, just keep in mind what that is, not 0.5, but make it 0.9. Now it's getting, the actual poles are getting close to the edge. And what that does is called, it, it, it causes a ringing or where you're going to get a, a peaking at where the pole is. It won't be a, a flat response. So keep watching this. Y'all see how, yeah, it has low pass characteristics, but there's this belly to it, right? You got a U type of shape. And you see where the pole is, you're getting, an ex it's accentuated. Now what this will do, if you, tr if you run say a U of T or a U of N function as the input to this filter or a delta of N, what it'll do is cause ringing. Your filter response will not be just low pass, when you'll get some ringing, it'll damp down. You follow me on this? And you know, you've had circuits. Do you remember there was underdamped, overdamped, and criti critically damped circuits, correct? Do you remember those? Well, underdamped is when there's not enough damping and there's ringing on the output. It's like the L and C have, if it's a standard low pass filter with analog parts, it'll ring before it's stable, right? You don't want that. You want it critically damped where the signal will show no ringing, will have a maximum amount of filter response in the time domain. So do you tell, can you tell that it's doing the ringing by the dip in the middle, the U shape? I can, I can tell in, in a heartbeat when I look at this, when I look at this, let me run it again. Whenever I see this type of a peaking at the pole, I know I'm going to get some amount of ringing. When you put it back to 0.5, and for some reason that's a magic number for a simple filter, you're going to see almost no ringing. I mean, no, there's, it's more or less flat. Can you all see that? Mm -hmm. So the closer you get to a pole, the more ringing there will be? Right, and that pole is actually the 3 dB point. That's where the filter breaks off as 1 over square root of 2. And if it was power, it would, the power would go down by a factor of one half, the maximum power allowed okay. through the filter. That's why they call it the half power bandwidth. And it's really from the, from here to here where the poles would be. Okay. Could you explain what you mean by ringing? Okay. I'll show you what, what I mean by ringing. If we take, um, let me do it this way. I'll just I pull also up this. Have, uh, question as well. So you went from 0.5 to 0.9 and it did the ringing. Will it also do the ringing if you go from like 0.5 towards zero? Like, I guess. No, then, then what happens, then the filter becomes less and less effective. Okay. Right. Let me just talk about ringing for one second. Okay. Because I don't know how much Dave Irwin or whoever you had for circuits talk about. Yeah. In my circuits, they didn't cover ringing at all. Um, you know, when you have an LRC circuit, you're going to get forms of solution that are either going to have 
um, B just T e to the minus a T that's called a critically damped system if you put in an impulse or there would be e to the minus a t that's a under damp i mean an over damp system or it will be e to the minus a t times sine or cosine of omega naught t do you remember this no as as <laughs> yeah chris and i were in the same circuits class and we barely got yeah. to filters i mean I, I remember it from diffy q with mechanical systems but circuits didn't cover it all right let me back up for one second. This is helpful to me because now I know my audience, what they need to see. So before we go to Z-transform filters and underdamped, overdamped, and all that stuff, uh, critically damped, when we have circuits in general, and just work with me on this, so if I have a circuit like this, where I have an inductor, right? And I'll put it in series, a capacitor and a resistor, right? And the only thing I'm going to look at is the impedance of this. Matter of fact, why don't I get the transfer function of this? Um, let me redo this. Inductor, resistor, and capacitor. Here's the input. Here's the output. All right. I'm going to be doing this in the A. I'm going to look at H of S being equal to V out of S over V in of S. So the inductor would have an impedance of SL, the resistor would have an impedance of R, and the capacitor would be one over CS. Does everybody agree with that? Mm -hmm. Y'all say this? Yep. All right, now, when I go ahead and want the transfer function, this is a simple series circuit, so it would be the output impedance, it would be one over CS, right, over the sum of all impedances, which is SL plus R plus one over CS. You all agree with that? Mm -hmm. Now, what I wanna do is put this in a form of something I can do the inverse Laplace transform of. So if I take a look at this, I'm gonna first go ahead and multiply everything by and just let me tell you what I want. Here, I want one over LC. So I'm gonna first go ahead and divide everything by L, all right? And remember, that's a C there. And now I'm gonna have one over LCS over S plus R over L plus one over LCS. Y'all follow me? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to arrange this in a way I can do the inverse Laplace of. And now I'm gonna multiply everything by S. So I get S squared, S, that S goes away, and that S goes away. I'm left with one over LC over S squared plus S times R over L plus one over LC. Y'all agree? Mm -hmm. Now, typically what they do when they talk about circuit, I mean, impedance analysis and the frequency they make, they make this omega naught squared. All right, I'll do this. I'm just gonna leave it as one over LC over S squared. And they usually put a damping factor here times S plus omega naught squared. And here omega naught is equal to one over the square root of LC. And the damping factor is, I'm, I'm showing you as just gamma here, is going to be equal to R over L, right? Y'all see this? I'm trying to do justice to you. I mean, it's a fair question. If you, don't, if you didn't get it in circuits, you should have. You should have had in Diffie Q2. But uh, now I'm asking you this. What's the inverse transform, Laplace transform of one over S plus a, I mean, s squared plus a s. Can you move it down a little? Yeah, you can see it now, right? Mm -hmm. Plus omega naught squared. Well, what's the inverse transform of that? We don't know because what? It depends on the values of a and omega naught, right? If this was something that could be factored as one over and call it s plus 
a squared. If it could be factored like that, right, then this would have a response of what? Just t e to the minus a t u of t, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, now what if it can't be? What if we have complex poles? If we have complex poles, then you would have to factor it of the form one over s plus a over two squared, right? And then it would be plus omega, a new omega naught prime squared, right? You'd have to calculate what that is. Correct? Do you remember this? Mm -hmm. Give me a thumbs up if you understand what I'm talking about here. Because this is, this is where you're going to have ringing. Well, what's the transform of that? Normally, there's an omega naught here. Forgive me for not scaling this properly, but this will have the form of what? E to the minus A over 2T, right? And it's going to be times a sine of omega naught T U of T. Do you remember this? Omega naught or omega naught prime? Well, prime, sorry. Okay. Really, I'm just trying to show you it's a sine wave that's being multiplied by a decaying exponential. Do y'all remember this class? Let me see if I have those yep. transforms available. I'm just going to check one thing. So y'all. I don't. I, so I have a quick question. I'm trying to recall from Diffie Q. It's been like five years since I've had that class. But can't you look at the determinant and tell if it's critically damped or over damped? You can. Because if it has complex poles, you know it's under damped. If it has a double pole, it's critically damped. And if it has two unique poles, then it's uh, over damped. Okay. Uh, but let me do one thing here. Uh, here, see this? Sign yes. goes to this. All right, that's my point. So I know I have something like that. And then if I have two separate poles, I'm going to get e to the minus um, a1t uh, plus with a constant in front plus another constant e to the minus a2t u of t. And this is where you do pole ex partial fraction expansion. My point is that the values of r, l, and c dictate what happens. Now, when I talk about an underdamped or ringing, this is what I mean. Let's assume we have something that rings, so I'll create that. I'll just let t be equal to the linear spacing of, and I'm over time, so if somebody's didn't mean to take this long, but I'm trying to answer the question. If you need to go, you go. A lin space from zero to say two, uh, make it 200 points. I'm just creating something that's got from zero to two as its range in time and 200 points there. Now, if I have that, then I'm gonna, hold, I'm gonna create the thing, x of t is equal to exp, and I'm just creating numbers here, minus say t over two times dot times sine of say 5t, 5 pi t, hold up, 5 times pi times t, and then I'm simply going to plot t and x and take a look at it. Uh, I got to do that or else I get a ton of points. Um, ah, what did I forget? That. Oh, array indices. Sorry. There, this should do it. Now you see how this thing's basically ringing down? That's, that's an underdamped system response. It's not damped enough to get rid of the ringing. This is ringing when you see this thing going, Baron. It's just like a, in this, you get this in audio systems all the time. You'll hear, Ming. it kind of damps out. It's a ringing because it doesn't have the critical features. Somebody's, what is this? I got, is there somebody with chat? Oh, thank you, whoever put that up there. MIT's got this stuff. 
Yeah, I because re I remember from DiffyQ, like we used uh, what was called the exponential response formula to yeah. solve these. I mean, it's, it's the same thing, but um, yeah, this, see, this is like a PDF that explains it a little bit. Right, and eventually what happens is uh, when I start changing these constants, you get a critically damped system. Critically damped is this. And it's not scaled, but, and I should let it go out longer, may it go to say uh, seven, and I'll make it go to 10. Critically damped is this, and this is important, you see this. It goes to a peak, but when it comes down, it never crosses zero. That's called critically damped. You all see that? Can everybody see it? Now, and you saw under damped, and then over damped is when you just have two exponentials, you have this, like e to the minus t plus exp to the, and it might be a minus here too, by the way, minus e, e to exp to the like three times t. Just showing you, <laughs> what did I do? Is there a plus? Oh God, there's a plus. Sorry. And you see how this thing has the character, and I put a negative sign there on purpose. It has the characteristics of the critically damped system, but it's a over damped system. It goes right to zero quickly and stays there. You see that? I mean, approximately is it's going to zero. That's called an over damped system. You remember this, guys? How, how many remember this from your your circuits or your Diffie Q or whatever course you do. So that's real important because the ringing is the thing you don't want. That's my point about that. And when we were in doing digital filters, where is my digital filter thing? I had it up there. Here, I think. When we were doing this, let me run it again. This will have no ringing in the inverse Z transform of that. Oh gosh. I got another meeting. I'm five minutes late too. Um, I got to go. Uh, but I'm going to give you some more homework. We'll get on this topic on Monday. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, uh, you, you guys are a little late, <laughs> but I understood. I'll give you some more homework. We'll talk Monday. I got to go to another zoom meeting. So take care everybody. Thanks. Uh, I was trying to get this thing done. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Take care.